Now, the late Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu has been described as the greatest gift not only to the country but also to the rest of the world. Tutu played a major role in the fight against apartheid and was a champion for peace and forgiveness. To reflect on the Archer's life, we're joined by uh, Professor Peter Storey, who joins us virtually. Thank you so much, uh, Prof, for your time here on All Angles. Your friend of 46 years, really condolences from myself and the team, uh, share with us some of uh, the happy moments that you had together? Well, it was impossible not to have happy moments with uh, Desmond Tutu mm. um, because joy was one of the gifts that arose out of his life of prayer and contemplation and a sense of self which he believed had been given him by a God who placed his image in every human being. And, and so, although the struggles were incredibly fierce and although we underwent some, some desperately dangerous moments together, um, and he far more than I, um, joy was never, never far from the surface. And I think one of the things that uh, his his adversaries just couldn't understand was the fact that somebody who was under so much pressure, and believe me, they were they were putting pressure on him in different ways every day. Somebody under so much pressure could still bubble with the kind of joy and humor, for instance, even in the darkest moments, when it looked as if they had all the power and the churches and the liberation movement leaders and so on seemed to be crushed under that power. That was the moment when uh, Desmond Tutu would stand up and say, Mr. Burta, why don't you join the winning side before it's too late? Uh, and he meant it. The point is he believed and knew that that was going to be the case. Uh, but nevertheless, to be able to bring up that kind of humor at that moment um, was very special. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, when I can imagine how you felt when you heard about his death, but also hearing uh, that his wife, Mama Leah, was saying that, you know, the arch was ready to leave. He was content with that path. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, long, long ago, he said to the regime, um, I'm not afraid of you. There is nothing you can do to me that will make me stop what I'm doing. Because the worst thing you can do is kill me. And I'm not afraid of death. Now, that's, of course, rooted in his faith mm. um, in the resurrection and uh, the fact that death is not the end. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, as he was coming towards his last days, and of course, there have been uh, long, long months of, of, of pain and, 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 and intermittent pain and, and, and struggle. And because he's a contemplative, he has given deep, deep thought uh, to his death before it came. And... Uh, Two things I'd like to say. The one is, I think he went to his death sad about our country, but nevertheless at peace about what he had been able to contribute uh, more than any of us, any one of us, uh, any all of us, in a way, mm. uh, to, the, to, to, the, to, to the benefit of our country. So those two things, I think, went with him. He was sad about what has happened, the betrayal of the profound principles which drove the struggle for liberation, and especially those who led it from the church's point of view and gave it a deep moral content. He once uh, said to me, Peter, we know our Bibles, we know our theology, uh, and we know human nature is frail, and so we shouldn't be too surprised at what has happened with all the greed and the corruption and so on. Mm. And then he said very wistfully, but we are allowed to feel very sad.
Mm, absolutely. Uh, and Prof, you know, looking at the importance of the church, I mean, um, the arch played a very vital role in many of, uh, you know, the social ills that are happening in our country. Uh, but of course, you know, as the archbishop and the first person to be nominated as uh, the first black person to be nominated as bishop in um, Johannesburg, at least, and then you grow up and you see all these other priests that are mushrooming with these, fa these fake churches, as I'd like to call them, who are using people's faith and desperation, uh, you know, to heal um, and using the church to do that? Well, you know, right since the book of Acts, there have been charlatans who have recognized that they couldn't be big money in religion. Mm. And we have to put up with these people on the fringes of the authentic faith. And um, you'll find them in every religion, I think. And it's sad because it gives Jesus a very bad name as far as we Christians are concerned. Um, and and we, can, we can do without that kind of exploitative abuse of people's need for spiritual certainty and the milking of, of people for their money by these fake prophets and apostles and bishops by the dozen these days. Mm. I thought it was quite unique to be a bishop once. I don't anymore. I, I, I try not to use the title because everybody else seems to be uh, climbing on that bandwagon, making themselves bishops. However, having said that, people out there are not fools. And they know the real thing when they see it. And in Desmond Tutu, we saw the real thing. We saw a life committed utterly to God and to the care of human beings made in the image of God. We saw a love which was genuinely rooted in the love of the one whom he followed all his days. We, we saw somebody who I think kind of matches the, the character. You know, Jesus once preached a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, and it was about the kind of new world that he dreamed about, of justice and compassion and decency and care and, and so on. And then he said, right at the beginning, he said, but if we're going to have that kind of world, we're going to have to have a special kind of person, people who are humble, people who know their need for God, people who hunger and thirst to see justice prevail, uh, and, and, and so on. We call that list of qualities the Beatitudes. Desmond Tutu was a Beatitude person. He had so absorbed the spirit of the love and gentleness and tenderness and mercy and powerful commitment to justice of his God, that it became part of his being. It ran in his bloodstream. Mm. And wherever he went, I think people felt it. Mm. Now, if that's what you call a saint, let's call him a saint. And of course, he was a very truthful person, whether it be politics or whatever else is happening in the world. He let his opinion know, um, even in the church, which could have actually, uh, you know, uh, been against him for coming out and saying, I'm not going to get to a heaven and find a homophobic, a, a homophobic God. You know, he uh, decided as a bishop and an archbishop that he's not going to be homophobic. He's not going to send people away. And today we still have pastors who do that, who believe that uh, people who are gay don't have any right to praise the Lord. But at the same time, even with his fight, his activism against HIV, he never pretended to be a person who can heal HIV. He just said, give people what they need to stay alive so that they can live their lives. Absolutely. You know, I'll take you back many, many years. When Desmond Tutu went so once to Denmark and he, he, he made a call for the Danish uh, to stop buying South African coal, and there was an enormous furore back here in South Africa. And when he came home, there were member churches of the SACC who were protesting and saying, this man's going too far. And so I called a meeting of those member churches. I was president of the SACC at the time. 
And, um, and I said, well, here is Desmond. Let's hear from him. And le let's see what we're going to, what kind of role is he meant to play amongst us? Mm. Are, you, are you happy if he's a prophet to the nation? Or perhaps do you need to hear things when he speaks to the church as well? And so we had a whole day of wrestling with that. And at the end of the day, we came out, I think, with an amazing uh, unanimity that God had given Desmond Tutu to the nation to speak sometimes very unpleasant truths in order to bring us out of our darkness of apartheid into a new South Africa. But that God had also, he wasn't just to be our voice as the churches. He had, he was called by God to speak God's voice into the churches and to show up our own imperfections. Now, I can't understand any Christian <laughs> who believes in a Jesus whose arms are, are spread out wide on a cross, embracing every single human being. I can't see how, how anybody can see that Jesus rejecting somebody because of a sexual orientation they were born with or a skin color they were born with. Mm. Uh, that's absurd to me. Uh, you, you know, if I'm wrong about that, um, you, you know, then, then, then let somebody prove it to me. But I, I don't believe so. Mm. Uh, I'd rather go to my death with my arms spread out in embrace to all human beings, as Jesus would, I believe, than to have them, you know, closed across my chest uh, with some kind of self-righteous um, code, which, uh, which, which gives me a special entrance into heaven. Mm.